dear students in my last presentation I was trying to talk about the introduction to the design of RCC footings wherein we had seen the background required for the design of RC footing. Further on we had started with the classification of foundations where we just mentioned that foundations can be classified under two categories that is shallow foundations and deep foundations. Under shallow foundations I had discussed two different types of shallow foundations that is spread footings or isolated footings and combined footings. I had just started with the discussion of the third type of uh, footing that is strap footing. So, as I just told very briefly strap footing is an alternative way to combine two footings one here and the other here and this particular footing that you are trying to see on the left side of the screen is close to the boundary and it is not possible for us to spread any part of this footing beyond this particular line because the property line ends here. So, what is normally done is this footing is connected to a interior spread footing by the beam which is called as the strap beam. So, the most important thing in case of a strap beam is the soil whatever we are trying to talk about under the beam okay, does not transfer okay, any pressure or there is no interaction between the beam and the soil beneath the strap beam. It just tries to transfer some amount of forces between the two spread footings. You are trying to see a typical photo of a strap beam that is being done. Now, as you know it is meant to combine okay, one or more footings especially when the footings are present okay, at the adjoining boundaries. Now, the next type of footing that we have is the strip footing. Now, this particular picture can easily tell you how a strip footing looks like. So, this is the plan of the strip foundation and that is the elevation of the strip foundation. Now, you have got a series of columns okay, and these are connected by one common footing. It is very similar to the combined footing but here we have many such columns placed one beside the other. Instead of the columns you can also have walls. Coming to the next one or the last one under this category we have the mat foundations. Now, as you can clearly see here the picture on the right. So, this is the boundary of the uh, layout or the site on which we are trying to construct. Now, we are trying to put one full footing okay, over this entire area. So, it is something like a mat that we have spread over the entire area on which we are trying to build the structure. So, basically it covers the whole plan area. If you look at the picture on the left hand side. So, this is the plan that we have here. So, what the circles you are trying to see are nothing but the columns. Okay, that comes and rests on this mat. So, from the elevation side you can see that there is a base slab. On the base slab there are number of columns which try to transfer the load onto this mat and the mat in turn will try to transfer the load to the soil. Now, the detailing that we do for this is very similar to that of a solid floor slabs or flat slabs. Again you have one more photograph of a mat foundation that is being done at a particular site and here this footing covers the entire area beneath the structure and supports all 
the kind of uh, superstructure that we have here which consists of walls, columns etcetera. Now when do we try to provide these kind of mat foundations? It is normally done when the soil pressure is very low that is the SPC is low or the soil is weak and the loads are very heavy and when you are trying to provide the spread foundations or isolated foundations for all the columns and because of the weak soil if the total area of the spread footings exceed more than 50 percent or that then it is wise to use a mat foundation. Now the next kind of foundation that we would be talking about is the deep foundation. Now as you understand if the ratio of the depth of the footing to width of the footing is less than 1 we consider it to be a shallow foundation whereas in case of deep foundation the ratio of the depth of the foundation to the width of the foundation if it is equal to or exceeds 1 you can assume that the foundation is treated as a deep foundation. Now when do you try to take this foundation okay, that is to a larger depth. Now this is done when the SBC that we are trying to talk about right is available adequate SBC is available at a larger depth below the ground level. So if this is the ground level so just beneath the ground level at shallower depths we do not have good uh, soil. So what we need to do is you have to go down okay, up to a point where you have good soil. So when good soils are available at larger depths obviously we have to take our foundations to those depths so that you can transfer the forces safely. Now under deep foundations pile foundation is a very popular kind of deep foundations. Apart from pile foundation you also have two more types that is pier foundation and well foundation. Now let us go to the first type of deep foundation that is pile foundation. Now this picture shows a typical pile foundation. Now as you understand this is the superstructure. Now the superstructure okay, below the superstructure you will have the substructure. So the job of the substructure would be to transfer the force from the superstructure to the soil. But unfortunately in this case the soil is very weak. I cannot expect this soil to resist okay, the load of the superstructure. So what is being done is you try to transfer the load of the superstructure to a uh, portion of the soil something like this bedrock where it is very strong and can resist the load. So what we do is we try to transfer the forces from here to here as in the form of piles pile is nothing but a column similar to a column. So we try to have a series of columns erected below the structure and we assume that the load would be transferred from the superstructure to the substructure through these piles. So on the right hand side you are trying to see a picture of a typical pile. So this is the enlarged view of this particular structure. Now, Generally this as I told you it is done okay, when we have weak soils below the structure. Now this is one picture where you can clearly see a number of piles okay, are being driven into the ground and you are trying to build a superstructure on this. Now in this case the material used for piles is timber. So this kind of situations or piles are commonly used in western countries whereas in Indian context we try to use piles made of reinforced concrete. Okay. Now let us try to go to the uh, next part of the slide that is uh, yeah. now this is uh, uh, one more picture of a pile foundation. Now the picture on the left shows the structure 
below that we have the piles and the piles are sitting directly on a hard bed of rock. Now, if the depth at which hard rocks uh, are available are small, then it is possible for us to directly rest these piles onto the rock and assume the forces to be transferred to the rocks directly. This kind of arrangement we call as the bearing piles. That means, these types of piles you can call it as bearing piles. Now, we can have another situation where bedrock is present at a very, very large depth in which case the length of the piles would be quite large. So, what can be done in this case is we can design the piles such that it has adequate sectional area and length such that the total load okay, that is transferred from the superstructure would be resisted in terms of the friction, skin friction okay, that would be developed on the surface of the pile. So, here we try to equate the total amount of surface area that is required okay, to resist the load in terms of friction. So, we try to balance the two and we try to design the number of piles the diameter of the piles required to transfer the forces. So, in this case the piles we call as the friction piles. Sometimes we can design a pile as a combination of bearing and friction pile. Now, I am just trying to show you some pictures of typical pile foundations. Please do understand the most common type of deep foundations are pile foundations. So, this is a process of uh, pile driving and for you to drive a pile you will try to have such kind of instruments okay, at the side. Pile driving is very similar to driving of a nail onto the wall. I think you need a hammer, you need a, a nail and you try to hit okay, the nail okay, into the wall. A similar process is being done. So, that is we are trying to drive a pile into the ground. So, you need to have a, a heavy kind of mass of hammer okay, which will be dropped okay, onto the piles and you can drive it similar to the driving of a, a nail or you can also do in a different way. We can also do what is called as in situ pile driving okay, or you can cast in situ. There are many ways in which we can try to drive a pile. So, these are some pictures that you can clearly see okay, process where we have a crane and it is being driven. Okay. This is you can clearly see that as the pile I was trying to talk about which is being driven to the ground. Okay, there would be a mass coming and hitting on this. So, and this is the process after which it has been completed. So, number of piles are being driven okay, into the ground. Now, whenever we have a group of piles okay, so that is which are required to resist a particular column. So, normally what we do is we try to have an arrangement called as a pile cap here. So, we try to have a pile cap okay, which would be present on top of the piles and on this pile cap you will have a column okay, coming and resting on this particular pile cap. So, the picture on the left you can clearly have this we have a column arrangement on below the column you have the pile cap it is similar to the slab base that we have a, for a spread footing. Now, below this you have a number of piles. So, I hope you have understood how exactly it looks like. So, the picture on the right you can clearly see a part of a uh, 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 pile arrangement is being shown here a cross section. So, above the ground you can have uh, the uh, sand okay, that is the layer. So, you have the uh, uh, tower okay, above the ground below the ground you have that uh, 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 that is the pile cap uh, below the pile cap you have series of piles okay, that will try to transfer okay, the load from the superstructure to the substructure. So, this kind of arrangement would be there under each of those legs that you are trying to see in that particular picture. Now, let me come to the next kind of uh, deep foundation that is the pier footing. So, pier in general is nothing but a huge pillar okay, which is resting okay, which tries to support Okay, a bridge kind of a structure or any other kind of a structure like a flyover 
or an aqueduct etc. So, we would like to have some kind of a support okay, for this that is footing and a general kind of a pure footing would be something like this. So, we try to take a mass of concrete okay, something like this okay, below the ground level okay, and that would spread into a larger area. So, that the force from this pillar okay, would be transferred to this kind of an arrangement and goes down and uh, transfers the load to the soil. This is one more picture that we have here to the right okay, that we that we can sorry for this okay. yeah. So, this is one more arrangement that we have here for the pile you can again have a cross section of the uh, pile that is below the pile you have a footing like this and which spreads down so that the load is transferred safely onto the soil. Now, the picture on the left how you can construct a pier foundation. So, I can have a, a well constructed base okay, separate base for this particular pier or I can have a pier connected to this in the form of a bulb. So, for this kind of an arrangement obviously, you need to dig the earth to a larger extent beside this. So, that you can place this regular footing comfortably and on top of that you can clear clearly construct a pier. Whereas, here the space required would be very small for excavation when compared to this type. But however, in both the cases the requirement is at the bottom you require a larger area okay, for the load to be transferred. So, here it is done like this whereas, here it is uh, the arrangement would be something like this. Now, coming to the last type of uh, deep foundation which we call as the well foundation or Kaizen foundation. So, here what is normally done is a hollow box or a cylinder that means, in cross section it may look like a box or it can look like a cylinder. So, that would be prefabricated and this would be brought to the site generally this kind of well foundations can be seen okay, in case of bridges on rivers. So, this uh, huge box okay, would be sunk into the river okay, and then water inside the uh, huge boxes would be excavated out and people can go inside this huge uh, uh, box, they can excavate more soil okay, from underneath the boxes and they can just try to excavate in the process the box would be sunk further. So, once it is uh, sunk to the desired extent, so you can under understand that we can try to replace that entire volume okay, inside the box by means of concrete. So, this is what you need to understand over here well footing that means, you try to create a well okay, in the form of rings okay, or uh, boxes. So, just try to put it into the uh, river bed is it all right and you just go inside that particular well try to dig earth okay put it outside in the process you go on sinking this particular uh, 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 kind of uh, box kind of arrangements or cylinder kind of arrangements till you try to sink it to the desired depth and then the interior of the concrete entire of the box would be filled with concrete so that's what we try to do over here so most often this is used in bridge kind type of constructions Okay, and the other structures where you require uh, uh, to be done in case of waters or rivers things like that. So, this would uh, 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 conclude with respect to the types of foundations. Now, let us try to go to the next part. We just try to mention that uh, footings can be of uh, shallow type or uh, uh, deep type. So, here that basically depends on the depth to which we have to put this particular footing. Now, one important thing that you need to understand here is there are many factors which influence the depth of the footing. It is not a simple uh, thing to decide. So, as you can clearly see there are a lot of factors. I will just try to go through these factors one by one. It depends on the bearing capacity of the soil. As you understand the bearing capacity of the soil will change from place to place. So, that is a very important factor which decides the depth. Apart from that, it depends on the settlement characteristics. 
settlement is nothing but the amount of vertical movement that is, uh, the soil can have under sustained loading. So, it also depends on that. It depends on the water table that we have at the site. It depends on the seasonal moisture changes. As you know, in summer, okay, the amount of moisture content would be less. In case of winter or sorry, rainy season, the moisture content would be high. The freeze thaw situation, that is when the temperatures change, okay, that is from very high temperatures to very low temperatures, right from morning to to the midnight. So things may change. Hydraulic considerations, filled up ground the burrow of animals, the neighboring structure, they also influence the depth of the foundation. If you have a sloping ground, then minimum depth according to the Indian standards, the height of the structure and finally, dynamic loading. So, all these things decide the depth of the foundation. So, once you know the depth of the foundation and width of the foundation, so you can just try to finalize whether you are talking about a deep foundation or a shallow foundation. Now, let us come to a very important topic of discussion that is the bearing capacity of soil. Because when we talk about design, we always talk about the bearing capacity of the soil. So, that is what is the pressure that we can safely uh, put on the soil. So, here the allowable bearing capacity that means what is the pressure that we can put on the structure is taken as the smaller of the following two criteria. So, as you can say there are two criterias that we have here. So, let us try to understand what these two criterias are. Okay, the first one we call as the safe bearing capacity. The second one we talk about is tolerable settlement. So, based on these two criteria you are trying to fix up the allowable pressure that we can put on the soil. Let us take the first category that is the safe bearing capacity. So, the safe bearing capacity is the safe extra load that soil can withstand without experiencing shear failure. Please do understand soil already is loaded that is the self weight. Now, what extra load beyond the self weight we can put on the soil so that it will not fail. Now, the basic kind of failure that we always expect in soil is the shear failure. So, hence based on the ultimate capacity, the safe bearing capacity can be calculated as the ratio of the total load by the area of foundation. That means, okay, so by this you can easily uh, arrive at the dimensions of the footing. So, we would investigate the soil and try to calculate the safe bearing capacity, the maximum pressure that we can put with respect to the failure criteria. So, once you know the SBC, you know what is the total load acting on the structure. So, obviously, the area of the footing can be easily calculated. So, this is a very simple equation okay, which can help you to arrive at the area of the footing. So, SBC has to be determined. Okay. Total load you would be evaluating okay, in the analysis. So, this can be obtained using this simple relation. Now, the next thing is, is SBC a unique value? Right. So, please do understand it is generally considered as a unique value at a particular site, but generally it also depends on the size of foundation you are talking about. That means, you talk about a small footing, a large footing etcetera. Okay. The SPC has to change a little bit. Right. It depends on the shape of the footing, it depends on the inclination of the footing, it depends on the inclination of the ground, it depends on the type of load it carries, it depends on the depth of the footing. So, a geo geotechnical engineer okay, should have enough information about all these things to give you a reasonable value of SBC that can be assumed okay, in the design. Right? So, unless all these informations are available, it would be difficult to arrive at this value okay, that is the safe bearing capacity. Now, in RCC that is when we uh, this uh, lecture started, I think you have been told that there are two limit states. There is one is the limit state of collapse and limit state of serviceability. Similarly, in geotechnical structures, when we are talking, talking about soil, we talk about two limit states. 
one is the limit state of shear failure criteria from which we try to calculate the SBC and the second one is the settlement criteria. So, the first criteria is not just a low, uh, sufficient okay, to just calculate the SPC, you have to consider even the second criteria that is the settlement criteria. So, again you have a picture of the superstructure, okay. you have the foundation that is the substructure, the soil should resist forces without failure or excessive deformation, without failure category 1, excessive deformation that is category 2. Okay. So, that is the two limit states that we are talking about. Now, what we need to do is you have to calculate the safe pressures that we can have under category 1 and under category 2 and then decide okay, which is the one that we need to take. Generally, it would be the lower of the two values that you would be taking and you call it as the allowable bearing pressure of the soil. So, generally in different sites that we normally talk about the safe bearing capacity varies from 100 kilonewton per meter square to 400 kilonewton per meter square. So, that is the rough range of SBC that you can have, but sometimes the SBC can be less than 100 kN per meter square, but generally this is the number that we would be using in most of the situations. Now, coming to the second one that is the second criteria, we were trying to talk about the settlements. Now, this is one uh, structure okay, in Mexico, where it has settled uniformly. Probably the uh, uh, structure was not designed okay, with respect to the settlement criteria. So, only the uh, ultimate criteria was considered, the structure was built. Okay. Now, what happened? Okay, the entire structure has settled below the uh, initial level right so this is called as uniform settlement that has taken place okay because of compression of the soil if this kind of settlements take place relatively it's it's okay but strictly speaking you should not have any settlements at all but if you just look at this particular structure okay where there is a differential settlement that means one side of the structure has settled more okay when compared to the other side. For example, in this particular case, so this part of the structure okay, has settled more okay, that means has gone down okay, relatively when compared to this portion. Please do understand the structure as it is okay, is relatively uh, 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 narrower in the sense not that big okay, laterally. In spite of that you are saying a differential kind of settlement okay, that is really dangerous. Whereas, in the, in the first structure though the structure is relatively large width wise okay, the entire structure has gone down. Now, generally when we have a uniform settlement there would be no internal disruption of the structure because it settles down as a mass okay, uh, uh, that is all the all the parts okay, will try to go to down together whereas here there would be a differential settlement and generally that would it would be uh, dangerous okay, for us. Uh, to have such kind of a situa situation. Okay. Now, I am just trying to show you uh, some more uh, pictures over here okay, where uh, we are trying to have uh, different types of uh, uh, failures. So, I think uh, this is one uh, structure where we have some cracks okay, along this side and again along this side. So, generally you can expect cracks okay, over there and this is again you can clearly I guess this you can see these kind of cracks that are passing through the masonry and there are few cracks that we have which pass through these planes okay and again there are few cracks okay that are trying to progress like this right so in these structures i'm just trying to show you what will happen if a differential kind of settlement takes place as i told you which is dangerous now i'm going to just try to show you a kind of uh, uh, work that a geotechnical engineer would really do to assess the SBC of a particular soil. Now, assume that this is the construction site that we have here. So, the first person okay, who would generally visit, so one of the first persons who generally visit a construction project okay, site would be a site engineer. So, who he would like to give you some amount of information with respect to the, the uh, uh, soil that we have at the site. 
So, obviously, he will try to uh, pick some amount of uh, uh, soil okay, that is by trying to excavate uh, deep into the uh, ground okay, some kind of samples would be collected and he may also test locally that is at the site uh, this particular sample to some extent. The collected samples would be uh, uh, will be trying to uh, take it uh, to the uh, laboratory that is he will try to collect some soil samples okay, and then he will try to investigate in the laboratory okay, on these particular samples. So, once he arrives at uh, some uh, values, so this soil properties would be transferred to a design office where this information that is the safe bearing uh, uh, capacity or the allowable uh, pressure or allowable bearing capacity would be transferred to the design office that would be considered for the design. So, once that is being done, so you design a structure and try to pass the design details onto the site, so that you can start your construction activities. So, generally this is what is important. So, normally we will miss as to all these kind of sequences. So, unless you try to investigate the uh, soil properties, especially the safe uh, uh, bearing capacity okay, that we can have for a particular site, okay, a structure may not be safe. So, you need to understand that it is not just sufficient to design the structure in the, in the for this for the superstructure part, it is also equally important to design the substructure portion okay, of the uh, soil part. Now, we will try to go to the next important discussion that we have that is the pressure distribution. Now, what is the kind of pressure that we would have under the structure that is under the foundations. Now, the most important thing that you have to understand here is even for symmetrical loading the pressure distributions may not be uniform. For example, look at this it depends on it depends on the rigidity of foundations, the soil type and the conditions of soil. So, it depends on so many parameters. Now, let me try to take a particular case something like this. So, I have a symmetrical loading is what you have here the type of clay or the type of soil that I have is under the foundation is a cohesive soil. So, when you apply a pressure on a spread footing like that okay, on load which is symmetric please do understand the pressure that develops below the foundation okay, can be something like this. So, okay, a, a non-linear kind of pressure distribution that we can have such kind of non-linear distribution okay, can be seen in case of cohesive soils like clay. If the type of soil uh, differs you take a different type of soil for example, uh, cohesionless soil something like clay the kind of pressure distribution can be something different uh, that is almost the reverse of this. So, here okay, there is interior you have smaller pressures exterior you have larger pressures whereas here interior the larger pressures exterior smaller pressures. So, basically the type of pressures that we have below beneath the foundation okay, differs okay, with respect to the type of soil that we have beneath the foundation. Okay. Now, generally what we do is we always assume okay, a linear kind of variation of pressure from one end to the other end. Now, in this case the loading is symmetric. So, obviously the kind of pressure distribution that we assume in our design okay, is something like a uniform pressure distribution this is because we are trying to apply a symmetric kind of loading. This is the kind of pressure distribution we normally assume. Now, if I subject this particular foundation to an extra load extra force that is moment, moment along with the axial load you can clearly see that the pressure distribution changes something like this. So, one end the pressure distribution is small another end the pressure distribution is large this can be easily obtained by superposing the pressure distribution due to P force and the pressure distribution to due to M force. When you try to add these two pressure distributions uh, the resultant pressure looks like this. So, this is maximum pressure at this end minimum pressure at this end anyway the kind of assumption that we make is a linear pressure distribution. So, what we would be doing later on would be we would be trying to take pressure distributions something like this in our foundations 
okay and we would be trying to calculate forces okay because of this pressure distribution and we would be trying to design the structure so that the slab whatever we are trying to talk about here has adequate depth and reinforcement to resist all forces that would be developed due to this pressure distribution. So, this is what you need to know once the pressure distribution is known you can calculate the internal forces like the bending moment, the shear forces and this can lead us to the calculation of the thickness and the reinforcements. So, all those things can be done once you try to determine the way in which the pressure is acting below the foundation. Now, coming to the next part that is the design of footing. Now, we just talk about the design of footing our objective would be to find out the amount of area okay, beneath the column okay, that we need to have for the foundation. So, that the pressure below the foundation okay, is quite uh, 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 adequate in the sense uh, uh, it the pressure developed okay, is less than the allowable bearing pressure. And we also would like to know what is the thickness of the foundation and finally, we would be calculating the reinforcements okay, which satisfy both the moment and shear considerations. Okay. Now, the input data that we would be trying to have with respect to the design of foundations are generally the load acting on the foundation and the moment acting on the foundation. Okay. Apart from that we also would be trying to know the SBC of that particular soil okay. and then the grid of concrete, grid of steel. So, with these informations it is possible for us to decide the type of foundation that we would be trying to have. Now, before we start with the designs, okay, so let us try to understand some clauses of IS 456 relevant to the design of foundations. Now, let us talk about a simple information like a concrete pedestal. Now, what is a concrete pedestal? A concrete pedestal is a part okay, uh, which would be there okay, below the foundation below the column and above the foundation. It is not mandatory that means, this part of the uh, structure is not mandatory. Please do understand below this pedestal you will have the foundation you will have the foundation. So, between the foundation and the column you can have a portion okay, which we call as a concrete pedestal right. It can be something like this at the base of the column you can have an enlarged column just below the base of the column which we call as the concrete pedestal. Now, if you are trying to talk about an arrangement like this a concrete pedestal. So, what you need to understand here is okay, the size of this pedestal okay, would be uh, decided based on this particular equation. That means, assume that Okay, this is the column and I fix up some dimension for this concrete pedestal it is a plain concrete pedestal. So, if I try to draw a line from the bottom of this pedestal from this point to the uh, uh, bottom of the column to this point this line will make an angle alpha. So, please to understand okay, this alpha okay, can be calculated using this relation right. So, there are two parameters that we have here Q naught and F C K. Q naught is nothing but the pressure that we would be having here which can be calculated as the load by the area of this will give me Q naught. F C k is the grid of concrete that we will be putting in this particular pedestal. So, once you have this information so you get alpha. So, the value of alpha that we would have should be more than this number that we get from this particular equation. So, if the value of alpha is less okay, then it is uh, not possible to have an arrangement like that. So, you can physically calculate okay, using this particular uh, relation the value of alpha that we need to have okay, and we can fix up this dimension and this dimension to satisfy this particular equation. Okay. Now, the next information is that we need to know are okay, thickness at the edge of the footing. So, when you have an isolated uh, foundation, so at the edge as we said you can have smaller depths. So, when we say smaller depths here the depth should not be less than 150 millimeters at any cost. So, that is the least depth or thickness of foundation that we can have as per IS 456 is 150 millimeters it should not be more than that. So, as you move towards the interior that means towards the column the depths can be larger than 150 mm. 
okay, but understand it is not that we have to have always 150 right it depends okay, on, the, on the design criteria, but you are not supposed to reduce below 150 mm at the edges that is with respect to the thickness okay, at the edge of the footing. Now regarding the grades of concrete, now the grades of concrete will depend on the exposure condition. Now as per IS 456 2000 okay, there are 5 different exposure conditions that we have here that is mild, moderate, severe, very severe and extreme. Okay, so this is spelt out by IS 456. Now for these specific uh, uh, I mean exposure conditions the grades are different. So if you have a mild type of exposure the grid of concrete that you are trying to use is M20. If it is moderate it is M25. It is severe M30 it should not be less than M30. Okay, for very severe and extremes it should not be less than M35 and M40. So when you are talking about designing of foundations you should need to know where exactly you are trying to put your structure under what environment. So based on that you would be trying to uh, assume the minimum grade of concrete. So keep an eye on the exposure condition and assume okay, the gradation of concrete accordingly. The next part would be the cover okay, to concrete that is cover in concrete to the reinforcements. Okay. The minimum recommended by IS 456 is 50 millimeters. So that means the bars of the reinforcements okay, because you are trying to put this structure within the soil and the soil can have different types of uh, 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 chemicals like sulphates, chlorides, etc. So we need to be a bit safe. So obviously and there would be water content, etc. So uh, they can move into the structure. So it is always advisable to have your reinforcements protected to a larger extent when compared to the that of uh, the reinforcements in the superstructure. So as per IS. Uh, 456 the minimum cover that we need to have for foundation anywhere in any kind of uh, place is 50 millimeters. But however if you have enough in information that the soil is aggressive, so the cover has to be increased and the minimum cover recommended here is something like 75 mm. Now regarding the grades of steel that we would be using okay, in this particular case are generally Fe 4 and 5 and Fe 500. So these are the more most popular type of uh, reinforcement bars okay, that we would be uh, grid of steels that we would be using. Next regarding the diameter of the bars, so generally we do not recommend the usage of diameter of bars less than 10 millimeters. Right? However, you can use diameters more than 10 mm, but generally the diameters okay, below 10 mm okay, is not recommended. So minimum 10 mm is what you have to provide. Now coming to some other principles okay, related to the design of uh, isolated uh, uh, column footings. So as you know okay, the uh, design is mainly done to resist the soil pressure acting below the bottom of the slab. I just talked to you about the type of soil pressures that we can have, So, but we always assume that the pressures are uniform. So when I say that is linear, so linear means it can be uniform when you have an axial loading and that a linear can be trapezoidal when it is subjected to axial loading and moment. So we would be trying to take these kind of soil pressures acting below the bottom of the slabs. So once you have a, a pressure distribution like that then what we do is we try to calculate the forces basically the bending moment and shear force due to this pressure distribution and the calculation is very similar to that we do in case of beams and slabs. Like generally we try to assume okay, each and every portion okay, of the slab beyond the column region as a cantilever beam or a cantilever slab and we try to calculate the value of bending moment or in shear force at the critical sections. Now unlike beams or slabs okay, we do not talk about deflections here because the soil Okay, is uh, uh, in contact with the or the uh, footing is in contact with the soil and hence okay, we do not generally talk about deflections. But however, when you talk about the cracks is it alright, they can be present and you have to keep an eye and see that the cracks are as minimum as possible in no case okay, 
that is the depth that is the width of the crack should not exceed 0 0.3 millimeters. Now regarding the depth of the foundation what is the depth that we need to fix generally. So this is generally considered from uh, Rankine's theory an equation suggested by Rankine's theory. So to use this particular equation okay, we need to have some informations like the SBC of the soil that is safe bearing capacity of the soil that is rho, the unit weight of the soil that is okay, and then the phi that is the angle of repose. So please do understand the unit weight and angle of repose and SBC all these calculations would be done at the laboratory and this information okay, can be determined. So once you have this information so we can always try to put in this simple equation and try to know what is the value of H. So where H decides the depth of the foundation that we would be trying to reach okay, so that you can safely transfer this force okay, onto the ground uh, without any problems. So the depth is normally decided by this simple equation given by Rankine's theory. Now the next part is with respect to the thickness of the foundation. As I already mentioned when we say thickness right we have minimum thickness as 150 mm but what about thickness at other parts is it alright. So as I told you we would be calculating two informations with respect to the pressure distribution one is the shear force another is the bending moment. So you need to understand that you have proper amount of thickness to resist the shear and flexure acting at those locations different locations and since I told you that uh, when you just talk about the portion of the slab beyond the column it would be like a cantilever beam or a cantilever slab. As you know okay, in a cantilever beam or a slab the maximum bending moment a maximum shear force would be at the fixed end. So in a similar way you need to understand that even in foundations when you are talking about your bending moment or shear forces they are critical in the vicinity of the column near the column the values of bending moments and shear force are large. Now the thickness of the column is generally calculated based on the shear criteria. Okay. So based on the shear criteria we would be trying to talk about the calculations of the thicknesses. Okay. I, there are two criteria one is flexure one is shear but generally thickness is calculated based on the shear criteria and not the, uh, the uh, flexure criteria. Now as I already told you it is economical to keep a minimum of 150 millimeters okay, as thickness at the edge of the foundations and generally the thicknesses keep increasing okay, as you move towards the column phase thickness goes on increasing and the maximum thickness that we have is always at the edge or, or at the edge of the column that is near the face of the column is what you need to know. Okay. So at any section the thickness should satisfy both the flexure criteria and the shear criteria and generally we try to have a bed concrete okay, below the foundation so that you have enough a leveling course okay, to put your concrete okay and uh, uh, that is the, the foundation so that you have a, a leveling course. Now there is also one more provision that you need to know that is if you do not put the leveling course okay, below the uh, isolated concrete. So generally this minimum 150 millimeters that we were trying to talk about has to be increased to something like 75 mm. So option 1 you put a level course of 100 millimeters and above this level course of 100 millimeters you try to have the spread foundation and you are trying to have a uh, that is uh, the cover to the reinforcement as 50. Sometimes okay, you do not put this leveling course you straight away have your concrete in which case okay, the portion below the uh, concrete would be treated as a leveling course and in which case you need to increase the cover to the concrete. Okay. So I think this uh, uh, discussion okay, has given you enough informations okay, with respect to uh, some basics of uh, the uh, uh, design. So I think in my next lecture I will be trying to talk about the criteria with respect to design of flexure, the design of shear 
okay and the design of uh, uh, bearing uh, design of uh, 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 development length etc so that once we know the concepts of those important parameters we can go through a few examples one or two okay in detail and understand how we can design the uh, concrete okay so this particular uh, uh, design of foundations so i hope you have understood okay this part of the lecture so i'll try to explain more on the design of foundations in my next lecture thank you